now move to the final session of the day, which begins with the presentation by our Wollaston medalist, Professor Chris Hawksworth, who is going to talk to us about the generation and destruction of continental crust. Chris. Thank you very much, and thank you all for still being here. Um, what I want to do is take what is a really old topic and see if I can persuade you that the new things are happening and new ideas are developing which may inform us in those discussions. Um, much of this work we're doing recently with Peter Kaywood, who's here, and Bruno Dream, who, for the most part, is St. Andrew's employee based in Bristol, as that's where isotopes happen. So, so that's the, our link to Bristol still. Photograph in the back is the Dammer origin, the Pan-African origin in Namibia, uh, with granites in pink here. In fact, they're probably Alaskites, for those of you looking for uranium. Melting in situ from the metasediments which in, in a way is the beginning of the differentiation of the crust, which we have to see back through if we want to look at the generation of it. And this, for the mantle enthusiasts, is a blue dike linked to the breakup of and the formation of the South Atlantic. Tiny bit of history, courtesy of Cherry, if I don't misquote her. Um, formation of continents. I mean, obviously our literature and geology is full of many debates about, about Formation of continents, about the movement of continents, the set continental drift, setting up of plate tectonics. But a lot of that debate is not really about how did the continents first form, how did the rocks within the continents first get derived from the mantle. And maybe for that, what we had to go to was to develop dating, which we're celebrating 100 years, a bit more Arthur Holmes and radioactivity, so that we could get precise ages, but also to use isotope ratios to tell us a little bit about when material got derived from the mantle in the first place. So the two things, dating and the use of isotope geology, has moved the debates into other areas. And, and to me, one of the surprising things, really, was this notion of how the age distribution looks. So these are just histograms, right? For four billion years through to the present day, the bottom slide, this is from Campbell and Allen in Nature a couple of years ago, is simply histograms of the ages of zircons from detrital sediments, in this case dominantly around Australia, but you could do it in any other part of the world. So this is sampling things, tiny minerals, in this case zircon, out of sediments to get some kind of representative picture of the age profile in a fragment of the continental crust. And you can do this in different parts of the world. And what is striking, even if you take global data sets, is that you still have peaks of these ages. And in essence, zircons we can take of, if you like, as the age of crystallization of a high silicon magma of granitic material. So this would imply there were peaks, there were times when you had relatively more granite crystallizing and more zircons, times with less, times with more, times with less. And if that's a primary signal, and that's the key question, I mean, how can that be on a fairly steady state Earth with plate tectonics going on around it? And that's the thing that really got us intrigued. And what's on here at the same time are these gray things, are the ages of supercontinent formation at the time we can best estimate and which gets worse as we go. So there's a coincidence between these peaks of crystallization ages of this tiny mineral zircon that links to making granite and the formation of these supercontinents. And is that likely to be a primary signal? On the top, just for comparison, is from Kent Condy, who has done something slightly different. He's taken peaks, he's taken ages of rocks that were derived from the mantle. So these are new fragments of continental crust. And again, they make peaks. And are those peaks primary? So the two things I want to look at is the significance of these peaks of ages. What do they tell us about the evolution of the, of the record we have from the continental crust? And when was the continental crust generated? in different proportions. And in case there are economic links as well, you can look at many aspects of the economic geology literature and also see that there are peaks of ages. All right, so this is uh, quantities of gold. This is age back to 3.5 billion years. These are peaks um, in terms of productivity or potential productivity, again, of ages linked again, apparently, at least back here, at the times of supercontinents. And the question is, if you see age profiles like that, does that tell you there was a real burst of stuff that developed lots of economic gold at this time? Or is this record simply not representative? And we have to see our way through that. 
And the extreme model, in essence, is easily articulated. If the, if, if the peaks are primary signals of the way the continental crust was formed and evolved, presumably we have to generate some kind of pulsed activity to generate. Most of us, when people talk about pulses within the Earth, then they link back to some kind of mantle plume argument that you would develop in some way a mechanism of linking pulses of activity to generate continental crust in some way to thermal instabilities within the mantle. The alternative is to say, actually, most of the rocks we have on the surface are driven by shallow level tectonics or plate tectonics, in which case the thing that dominates should be some kind of plate tectonics. And if you look at whatever argument you want to look at, trace element patterns of average crustal compositions, they have patterns much more similar to subduction zones than to mantle plumes. So you have that dichotomy. You have the pulses. If that's primary, it's mantle plumes. Look at the chemistry. It's not mantle plumes. It's all plate tectonics. How are we going to put them together? All right, well, let's just, this is just the same diagram again, just to do a bit of a thought experiment. So this, as I say, highlights that if you simply take lots and lots of detrital zircons, and you can take hundreds of thousands of them now from the literature, there's about uh, eight to 9,000 on this diagram. They have peaks of ages, and they link up to the times of supercontinents. And the question is, why might that be? One of the striking things, then, the thing I want to explore is while we can go to modern day settings and see where we make lots of magma, we also need to address the issue about whether that magma is likely to survive for long in the geological record. So in a sense, there are two issues about, in this case, igneous rocks. One is making them and the volumes we make, but the other is, are they likely to survive? And what this does is simply highlight that if we look at a, a conversion plate margin, what increasing numbers of people have argued all right, if you take active uh, colonial margins today, that you generate magma, let's use these figures, at 3.1 kilometer cube per year, um, of that kind of order, but you actually subduct sediment in, its, in approximately the same volume. So these sites that have lots of magma, lots of convergent plate margins, lots of subduction rate of magmatism, that would give us the signature of our continental crust, are actually destroying rock as fast as they're making it. So as a place to make a long-standing record of the continental crust, this doesn't look to work very well. So you make lots of it and you destroy lots of it. Conversely, if you go to places you know, protected from destruction, if you like, at least of the active tectonics kind, um, to the Himalayas or to a collision zone, the volumes of magma you make are much less. But their preservation potential, the chances of it surviving, are much greater. So if we try and put those together just as a kind of thought experiment, what might we see? And this simply tries to explore the notion of what happens through a supercontinent cycle. So we have a subduction period where lots of bits of continent coming together, driven together by convergent plate margin magnetism. We have a collision, and we have a breakup, and we have extension. And entirely qualitative, it's just to do the thought experiment, that if we take the subduction time, we make lots of magma at the present day. We go into a collision, we have obviously the end of subduction, and we get small volumes of magma generated, relatively speaking, within the collision phase. And then we have breakup, and it depends how much flood sort you want to make during continental break. The point about the studies on convergent margins today is that while we make lots of magma, we actually preserve very little of it i.e. we destroy it as fast as we make it, the continental crust in this moment. This is in terms of retreating and advancing arcs, which gives you a slightly different signal. If we come into the collision zones, we clearly, the blue line, we're not making much magma, but what we make is much more chance of preserving. And when we come out into extension, depends on rifted margins and what happens to flood basalts, the chance of survival is, is not great. So if you were thinking of what the age record would be of zircons made from magmas in these three different stages, they presumably would be some combination of this magma volumes versus um, preservation potential. And if you just do that very simplistically and just think about how that might look, so in the times of subduction, 
Make lots of magma, preserve very little, not many ages. During the collision, the, we preserve magma from the late, late stages of subduction and in the collision times. Not much magma, but lots of high likelihood of preservation. We're going to preserve ages from that time. And when we go out into extension, blood results are not great for zircons at the best of times, but even if there are lots of rhyolites, the preservation potential is not great. So you can do a thought experiment, all right, that says that these peaks of ages could be expected as a product of making the supercontinent. Not because that's a time of making lots of magma, but because it is a time of preserving lots of the magma in the geological record. Is there any test of that? One of the things we've been exploring and thinking about is whether if you actually could think a little bit about volumes or the numbers of zircons formed. On an order of magnitude geochemical calculation, all right, you know the volumes of magma and conversion margins. You know roughly its average distribution of silica contents in there. You can have a go at how much zircon you might crystallize. You can decide on the average size of zircon in your convergent margin. And if you do all that, allowing huge errors, right, you, you're going to get yourself to a position of estimating very roughly numbers of zircons of a certain size generated per million years per kilometer length of arc. And clearly, because the magma volumes say it, this is where the peak of zircon agents should be, not here in the collision zone or in the time of the supercontinent cycle, which is where we see it. So this is another way of articulating. We don't see all these zircons here. We appear to see them here. So these zircons, presumably, have been destroyed in subduction zones, as we predicted. The zircon record that we see is dominated by the supercontinents and that period of time. So that's a, a way of us arguing that the peaks of ages are not primary. Right? So the bias of what's preserved when you make a supercontinent, you protect it better in the geological record. And that's the reason that we have peaks of ages preserved. So if I just summarize what that would look like, so then this is just a summary of what I've just said. It's sort of present biases, if you like. So that from, let's say, 3 billion years, 2.7 to the present day, these periods of, of supercontinent development associated with peaks of ages, that this is a biased distribution of ages set up by the development of supercontinents, which has particular ability to preserve those ages. If you go back before 3 billion years, the chance of anything surviving is miserable. All right? So in a way, you know, there is less bias in any zircons you get. You're probably lucky to get your hands on. So I think there's much less, we can demonstrate less bias in the Archean and the Hadean um, than we can later. And, and the record we get, as far as one can tell, is not particularly biased by tectonics and that kind of work. So, so that's the age distribution. I want to do, move to the other thing then, which is this business about how we use isotopes to tell us when the continental crust was formed and, and whether we can get a handle on that and how ideas there have changed. So here is these common diagrams from the formation of the Earth back here, where the best we have here is a painting from the Nancy group showing exactly how hot, the hot Earth looked like before we had continental crust. Lots of meteorites, lots of volcanoes. Through to the present day, all right, and then this is the percent of continental crust of the present day, and these are various curves of how we got there. The brown curve, in essence, is the distribution of rocks of different geological ages at the present. So that's simply go map different provinces and see what proportion are of different ages. And as we all know, there are very few rocks from the Archean. There are more and more rocks from younger areas. The green curve is, again, the present day, but it's actually it's a model age. So it's when you think that crust was derived from the mantle and how that distribution varies. And here, too, there's not much we think was derived from the mantle at 3 billion years. There's a fair amount derived between 2 up to 1 billion years. And if you want to talk about crust reworking, we can come back to it. It's clearly material taken out of the mantle, reworked in geological events, and is reworked. As well. Then there are a number of models out there which suggest that the volume of crust through time was, was much more earlier in Earth history. An extreme model from Armstrong, which said, thermally, you should have made lots of continental crust very early. And what's happened? And the issue then is whether we can make much better progress in here. 
And, and that's what I want to just look at for the last few minutes. So it's a question of how we get to models of when the continental crust was formed and what that tells us about the thermal state and the evolution of the Earth. And the common way to do this often is to use sediments as a way of sampling the continental crust. People have done it for years to try and get average compositions of the crust, sample lots of sediments, it's done the mixing for us, take them back to the lab and analyze them. And people have tried to do the same with isotopes and where they take it. And the, the difficulty is, you know, if this is southern Africa, these are the Archean bits and the Mola belts around. If you took a sediment from off the shore of southern Africa and wanted to take the average composition of that sediment to tell you the average age or source age of the rocks of southern Africa, it would underrepresent the old stuff that's in the middle and doesn't erode so well. All right. So there's a bias when we take sediments to work out the volume of old crust those sediments represent. And that's the bit we need to get a handle on. And, and the key thing, let's go back one, the key thing that this gets us to, all right, that if we take this as some kind of unbiased record about the distribution of rocks when they came out of the mantle. Now, if this was developed from a sediment, and this was the proportion that you see, if that sediment underestimates the old rocks, then actually the volume of crust may have been way up here. All right. So the issue of the bias in the sedimentary record relates to, if you have a sediment that gives you this number, maybe underrepresenting the old rocks, which would put it up here and give you a completely different generation profile. So, so this is the same argument then. If you sample sediments around the southern Africa, the sediments themselves would underrepresent the material from the old bits in the middle. This is a common one. This is molasses deposits on the Pan-African again. And for people often sample these sediments to sample the age of these. How much, though, of, of are the ages, the average ages preserved in the sources of these sediments compared to those in the rocks that were actually there. And that's a bit we did a short experiment. This is uh, Bruno and Dream and others have published this a year or two ago. We tried to do a single, a simple experiment that took a, a present day river, the Franklin River, which flows from the Yilgarn Archean block in, in southwest Australia through a mobile belt and out to the sea. And clearly, for sediments along this, all right, you can work out the catchment area and the proportion of old rocks to younger rocks within the catchment area. And you can sample the sediments and see how well the old rocks are represented in sediments that are sampled here. So this is a way of doing the experiment in a recent system to say that if you sample a rock here, a sediment at the, at the mouth of this, River, is the Archean fairly represented or is it underrepresented given the catchment area <coughs> geology? And this just summarizes what you see. So, this, this is along the river, 300 kilometers along the river. This is the elevation profile, it goes through a slight escarpment here, which doesn't show up very well in this diagram. And this is simply the Yilgarn, so this is Archean, this is the mobile belt. And this is just the relative proportion of the Yilgarn that you would see. Obviously, if you're sampling stuff in the Yilgarn, you can only get Yilgarn. And if you simply measure off the source material available for the different sediments, as you, as you go down towards the sea, clearly you have more and more of a mobile belt available to sample. You have relatively less of the Yilgarn. You would end up with 65% Yilgarn. That's just off the map, right? So that's the stuff available to you. But if you go to the sediments themselves and you analyze zircons and nidium and clays and, and put all these things together, the proportion of the old rocks that you see are much lower. Go to, this, go to the river mouth and only whatever this is, 12% all right, of the bulk sample is of yield gone age. So only 12%, all right, of this material is from here. And yet, in terms of the stuff available in the catchment area, it should be 65%. So this shift from this line to these data is the bias produced by preferentially sampling young material. 
We express it as a k factor. The details needn't worry us. It's up here for argument. The bigger the k factor, the more the old rocks are underrepresented. The other thing in here is, of course, if you have high relief zone, you're going to preferentially sample these, and again, this is going to be underrepresented. So if we take those k values and simply look at them of how they would look for evolution of the crust, here's the volume of continental crust, the diagram we've seen before. Here's the time since 4.5 billion years to the present day. Here are data from shales and how they would look if there was no bias in the erosion of those shales and their development in the context of sampling the old rocks. But if we take the number from the last diagram and say the bias, the underrepresentation of the old rocks is of the order of, I don't know, 10 to 15 in terms of K, then we would have 65, 75% of the continental crust was already generated by 3 billion years. So it's beginning to get one way at getting to just how much continental crust was around at this period of time. Let us go briefly to one other way to do it completely independently, and, the, and the, the details don't matter, but it's just to show that it can be done independently. This is a recent paper in Science. This is simply the Hafnian model age in zircon. So this is when the source that was melted to form the granite that gave you the zircon was itself derived from the mantle. So it's when the crust formed, from 4 billion years to the present day, and it varies with oxygen simply so that Zircons with high oxygen contain a sediment component and therefore have some kind of mixed source age. Those that have values similar to magmas that came out of the mantle might reasonably be a way of looking at those that are derived from the mantle without getting confused by the mixing in the sedimentary horizon. And you can then profile all the zircons for the, which there is happening in oxygen and get a curve through time, the proportion of, of new crust formation ages, you go to old zircons, lots of them are, for, are developing new crust. Go to model ages of 2 billion years, much of it is reworking because the oxygens are high and come through to the present day and you can get the proportion of new crust back again. So you can interrogate the zircon record using oxygen to cast away the stuff that's hybrid and mixed because it's got sedimentary contribution and just go for the green stuff. And if you do that, then on the, exactly the same plot, Right, 4.5 to the present day, this is simply the curve that you would get from interrogating that zircon system. So again, separately from the sediments, just using the zircons, you come back again at 3 billion years with the order of 65 to 75% crust was present already compared to the present day. Two ways of getting in the same place. And the question is what that means. This is some kind of inflection if we stay with the blue curve. Interestingly, this growth rate is very similar to the rate at which magmas are generated in convergent margins, i.e. and would survive if you had no subduction. Well, this growth rate is clearly the one that we see when we do have subduction. So there's an increasing temptation to say this inflection marks the onset of subduction and plate tectonics as we know it at the present day. And there's other evidence from diamonds and zircons. These are when you start to get eclogitic inclusions in diamonds at 3 billion years and since that were not there before, which people have again used to say the onset of plate tectonics. So to wrap up, let us get back to this diagram we've been trying to look at already. Here, here's the present continental crust again, present day, 4.5 through to the present day. The brown curve again are the rocks, so these are the proportion of rocks of different ages on the surface of the Earth. These are the proportions of model ages if there was no bias. All right. If there's bias in the way that we've seen with the sediments and how they sample old material, or with the model we've just shown you with the zircons, you would have some kind of curve for the volume of new crust as it developed with time, and the temptation to infer some change at that stage. And if that's right, what are the implications? Think of that for a second. So if this is a model age, this is the distribution of when material came out of the mantle, as preserved at the present day. This is rock age of the present day. This is reworking stuff in making young orogenic belts of stuff that was generated then. 
But if we accept the argument that if you take these shales, all right, that they underrepresent old rocks and the volume of old rocks was actually up here, this is the indication of the volumes of crust that you made and then destroyed. All right. And to make it more focused, of course, if subduction really only started then, all right, you've started to destroy it at that time, and you might begin to look for mantle signatures of that destruction. The thing we don't address often enough, right, is that it's fine to draw these curves up there, even more up here, but this is some indication of the material that we have lost since the time it was formed. Because these are present-day distribution of rock ages, this is the present-day distribution of modeling. And it's form, and time goes the other way, I'm afraid. If we're, this is a sketch from Steve Foley. That what we think we know from the people looking at um, material from the mantle lithosphere, from inclusions in diamonds, that this is the sort of time when ecligite inclusions came in, we started stabilizing significant volumes from the lithosphere. Go back, this is the time people are talking about increasing evidence for the onset of subduction. This is the time at which the rate of growth of the continental crust changed markedly. Go back beyond that, we were making continental crust reasonably fast, right? but it's a question of whether we believe there was much in the way of discrete subduction of the kind that we see. Clearly materials coming out, so materials going down. That's not that issue. The issue is whether the Earth had got to a stage of, of cooling enough to give us discrete subduction zones we see. So what I hope I've persuaded you is that there is a whole issue about preservation potential is different from magma generated in different tectonic settings. And we have to take that into account as we interrogate the record of the, of the continental crust. As far as we can tell, that record is biased by the development of supercontinents because that preserves material that you would otherwise destroy. And it gives you those peaks of ages. So it's a secondary, not a primary signal. We've seen two arguments that 65 to 70% of the continental crust, the present volumes, might have been generated by the late Archean. All right, both the bias introduced in sediments and the zircon story we didn't have time to get into. And ourselves and another, under, another uh, number of other groups have taken different strands of evidence to say maybe plate tectonics only really got going the way we see it now at that change of continental growth rate at about 3 billion years. The change from this setting, perhaps, to this.